Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower, who is teaching in the very same circles in which I have been studying for the last three years. So this has particular meaning to me, this particular guest. Her book is called Luminous Darkness. Her name as an author is Deborah Eden Tull, but she prefers to be called Eden. And I would like to tell you a little bit about her while I welcome her to the podcast. Eden, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm truly grateful to be here with you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you are the founder of Mindful Living Revolution. So our listener, if you want to go look for her right away, if you're busy with your thumbs on your phone and you want to go to Instagram, go to Mindful Living Revolution on Instagram. That's two L's in there. You're the founder of Mindful Living Revolution. You're an engaged Dharma teacher. You are a public speaker, author, and activist. I hope I can grow up and be all these things. You've spent seven years as a Buddhist monk at a silent Zen monastery, which was where, can you tell us? In the Western Sierras in California. Oh, nice. Wow. Wow. You now offer retreats, workshops, consultations internationally. You teach Dharma intertwined with post-patriarchal thought and practices, resting upon a lived knowledge of our unity with the more-than-human world. You have other books, and they include, our listener, are you listening? Relational Mindfulness, which is a handbook for deepening our connection with ourselves, each other, and the planet. I can't wait to sink my teeth into that one. The Natural Kitchen is your other book, your guide for the sustainable food revolution. Your teachings bridge the personal, transpersonal, ecological, cultural, global, and mystical aspects, impacts of awareness practice, drawing upon your embodiment of inquiry, deep ecology, relational intelligence, animism, and conscious movement and dance to help people release the myth of separation, huzzah, and reclaim the authority of the heart. You are also, notably, a teacher of the work that reconnects, created by Buddhist scholar Joanna Macy, her whole body of work that was created to transform uh, our pain and love for our world into compassionate action. This is the core of engaged Buddhism. And I'm really, really honored to have you here. So thank you for being here. You're so welcome. And thank you for that yeah. generous introduction. You know, it's nice to really just say the full story, the full scope, because I know our listener, my listener, and I know that many of our listeners will be very excited to hear what Luminous Darkness is all about. So I first want to point out that this book, Luminous Darkness, the subtitle is an engaged Buddhist approach to embracing the unknown. You do not have to be a Buddhist to listen to this podcast or read this book. In fact, I would recommend that if you're not a quote-unquote Buddhist and you're curious about what all that peacefulness is and what all that sitting still is, this is a really good way to get introduced to the reason for that sitting still, which is, in my own estimation, so that we can have a deepening connection to ourselves that fortifies us and stabilizes us so that we can take compassionate action, as Joanna Macy implores us to do and all of our teachers implore us to do. Luminous Darkness is a masterpiece, I have to say. I've had it for a few months, and I really appreciate the level of depth and studentship that you've put into this book, and I'm really excited to share it. I'm touched, and we'll just say it was a really exciting, multidimensional, edgy book to write that took courage. And so it was a phenomenal inner process as well as a process that led to a product to share. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm particularly excited too. We share the uh, same publisher. Um, I just moved over to Shambhala and I'm excited for my next project with them. Fabulous. And the quality of the work, the editing, um, for our listener who's, you know, kind of a picky reader, I promise you won't be disappointed by this. Let's dive right in. Chapter one, Redefining Darkness. This is not just one of those books on darkness where you're going to realize that darkness is light. No, 
Darkness actually is darkness, and it is so important to go into it. You use the quote by Wendell Berry on uh, this first chapter page, to go in the dark with a light is to know the light. To know the dark, go dark. Go without sight and find that the dark, too, blooms and sings and is traveled by dark feet and dark wings. So beautiful. Your redefinition of darkness uh, for me has helped me through the period of three and a half, four weeks that I just came out of a winter practice period at Upaya Zen Center. So thank you for that. Your writing, which I had read right before I went in, really carried me through a couple of those sits in a very real way. You say, walking off trail through a dense forest, you live near the forest, is a metaphor that you will use for our journey into endarkenment. So this is obviously the opposite of enlightenment, but maybe it's not. There's no existing human-made trail for understanding darkness. A brightly lit path with signs pointing out the direction will actually never allow us to sense and feel our way into the mystery itself. And everyone's journey will be different and unique. I love the fact that you're focusing on an aspect of this larger Buddhist realm that isn't often focused on in sort of mainstream books like this one, and not implying that your book is mainstream, but that your book is available and it's just diving right into this matter. Becoming curious about darkness beyond my familiar associations is the ask that you have of your reader. And what I found in my own personal experience anyway during that practice period was this depth of connection and willingness to take responsibility for my past errors and failures and mistakes within myself that I had never, ever had before. So something is working here in your writing, and I want to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have four points on page 17, our awakening through embodiment and earth connection the restoration of our ability to see clearly with the heart by surrendering to receptivity and taking responsibility for the lens through which we are perceiving. Thirdly, the reclamation of our true nature or original consciousness by releasing hierarchical perception. There are two more. These are the five aspects of embodied meditation and spirituality. Number four, the deepening of our relationship with ourselves and others and our intercommunicative relationship with nature, the visible and invisible, um, this endarkenment, it does invite us into a collaborative spirit that I've never felt before. And finally, number five, the willingness to meet all life, including shadows, with fierce compassion. Where did these come from, dear Eden? What is going on here? This is there's so much wisdom in one page. I can barely stand it. Every page is folded and underlined. <laughs> so I want to begin by just naming how much I've always appreciated the most simple inquiry in Zen. Through what lens am I perceiving right now? Through what perception lens am I perceiving right now? And a practice of being curious about our perception lens so that we can step back into a more spacious, I would say more and darkened, clear seeing um, what's pointed to in Zen often as original consciousness, consciousness free of the perception lens of the overlay of judgment, hierarchical perception, bad, good, higher, lower, like that. We all know that aspect of the mind, the conditioned mind, well and what I'm sharing, the first part that you spoke about with the metaphor of the forest, is really inviting people to celebrate and to lean into in these times as an ally, the kind of receptivity and deep listening that exists within us beyond the labeling and categorizing of the conditioned or rational mind of the left brain. And that's a really popular perception lens in today's world. <laughs> and so at points in the book, I'm comparing our fixation with light, uh, with our fixation with rational mind and this tendency to label and want to understand life rather than 
drop into the darkness as we do traveling through a forest with no set path and listening with our whole bodies, uh, tactile listening, thinking of meditation as listening to life as it unfolds moment by moment. And I believe that both for the spiritual path, which is about moving through the unknown and the collective journey that we're navigating now because we're facing the collective unknown in a much more palpable way than ever before. This reorientation, which is more of a remembering uh, tools we already have inside, an inner compass we already have access to, it's really, really important. So you ask where this came from. (laughs) And um, I talk in the book about how I've always been uh, simply deeply inquisitive and curious myself, I've always been on the spiritual path, as many listeners perhaps you can relate to as well. When I was a kid, I uh, had a game I used to play, and it just made sense to me to close my eyes and to imagine that my entire body was an ear, and that my entire body had the capacity to just listen to vibration, to subtlety, to sound, Uh, to energy. And when I established a formal meditation practice and came to Zen when I was about 18, I recognized the value and importance, the wisdom of that game I played when I was a kid, (laughs) because it was so much about recognizing darkness as a great teacher of deep listening and this return to a kind of relational intelligence that occurs when we show up to life as our meditation. You know, sitting there in those 40-minute longer sits, facing myself for the first time in a long time, you know, for an extended period when that was like the fourth of those sittings that day. And remembering these words in your book about the darkness as uh, not just a tool, but a place, like a real destination, really helped me. The unconscious biases that you talk about I'm on page 21 now. Um, These biases that we carry, that we think we've come up with ourselves, that we think the good ones we've come up with ourselves and the shitty ones have been, you know, placed into us. It's so hard to get rid of them. The exploration that you invite into these biases, not just against hierarchy and patriarchy, but racism, classism, misogyny, sexism, the domination over nature, all of these aspects of ourselves that we are really mostly unwilling to look at, or even if we see it, we just kind of like, well, that's there. How embarrassing. And then we turn away from it. These do, as you say, have profound implications. You're pointing out the negative associations that we have with darkness in particular, and how that bleeds into all of these other biases. And I wonder, in your own life and experience, was there a certain context or a certain time of your life where that became abundantly clear? And that's where this whole exploration has come from. Thank you for that question. First, I want to share for listeners, the book invites the reader, one, to deeply question and examine our collective held unconscious biases the bias which values light over dark, then to step into a deeper exploration of what actually is darkness, if not the absence of light. Uh, You mentioned animism, part of my path at the beginning of this session, and animism recognizes that everything in life, in nature, carries consciousness. Those things that we see in physical form, like the tree I'm looking out at my window at, and things we can't so much see, the visible and invisible realm, both light and dark carry consciousness. So when we go beyond the biases we're associating darkness with, the definition in the Merriam-Webster dictionary being the absence of light, and then look at all of the major repercussions of that, that one's higher, one's lower, look to nature and recognize the sacred interplay of both and the value of both, something begins to open up, and then we can really begin to sense and feel uh, into this luminous darkness that the book points us to, uh, a fertile 
darkness. And then back to your question about if there was a kind of starting point for this awareness in my life. I wonder if many people listening can go back to childhood and just touch that recognition at some point, at some age, that a lot of the conditioning and assumptions of the world being handed to us didn't necessarily match our direct experience. And I remember one experience I'll point to is simply my first traumatic experience of loss, which is when I was 11. And my dad found out one day out of the blue that he had one month left to live. He was a yoga practitioner, a marathon runner, really healthy. And then this hit. And the experience of going through grief in what I describe as a culture of sun shining, let's keep it light, let's get you fixed and better as quickly as we can, let's keep a smile on your face and turn away from that grief. Not so much that that was coming from family, but certainly from the society surrounding us. Just help me to see, because it so didn't meet me where I was. Uh, no adult, <laughs> except maybe a wonderful sixth grade teacher I had, uh, seemed to have the quality of presence to know how to be with me in that grief. It just began to teach me that I needed to look within and really reckon with the fact that given traumas I experienced directly after that as well, dark times, dark emotions, uh, the intensity of the human experience, the intensity of the social justice work I witnessed my whole life through my mom, that it wasn't a whole world of sunshine existed <laughs> that was trying to push away <laughs> darkness and that was trying to keep us, quote unquote, comfortable, keep things light, keep things surface. And I simply couldn't um, digest that. It wasn't true for me. It wasn't helpful. And as I came to my own uh, committed meditation practice and felt the biggest relief in the world that here in meditation, I could finally welcome all the full spectrum of light and dark within myself and the world, the full spectrum of emotion, not categorizing this as positive, this is negative, this is a demon. Is it really or is it a sacred messenger about to transform you and empower you? So I got to, through meditation and my own personal journey, really wake up to the vitality and uh, beauty and sacred teachings of darkness alongside the teachings of light. So just for the record, I'm certainly not dissing enlightenment. It was the pursuit of enlightenment that um, inspired me on the path, but invoking something more in a world that seems to have become very imbalanced, the imbalance between yin and yang, sacred feminine, sacred masculine, restoration and productivity or doing. <laughs> we apply this productivity and doing to everything. Um, yeah. You with me. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. You actually included a piece of the song of the Jewel Mirror Samadhi, which is something that we chant in liturgy at Upaya. And uh, I thought I would say it here: light and darkness are a pair, like the foot before and the foot behind in walking. Each thing has its own intrinsic value, and is related to everything else in function and position. So I'm simple. So happy to read that. And so simple. So powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really nice to see it contextualized like that. And then when we were chanting it when I was there, it was just like, yes, this is not just some chant and a bunch of words. This means something to me. Yes. You know? Yes. Part two of the book is called Fruitful Darkness in the Realm of Emotional Intelligence. I assume you've read uh, Roshi Jones' book, Fruitful Darkness. Yes. It's one of the best. I'm with you. All of her writings. <laughs> yeah, all of her writings, exactly. Our listener, in case you missed that, Fruitful Darkness is the name of my teacher's book, Roshi Joan, that is well worth reading if you want to grab it along with this one. Page 55, On Fierce Compassion, Remembering the Sacred Partnership of Light and Dark. It is by staying present, quote, to what is 
that we find a freedom far greater than the utopia we are seeking. It is by staying present to what is that we find a freedom far greater than the utopia we are seeking. We can stand in unity with ourselves and one another, offering the fierce compassion that says, I am here with you, no matter what. And we can feel our grief together. Also, this statement has been a guiding principle for me. I'm just going to quote it in a post, mostly for myself to remember, that unity with ourselves by staying present to what is, especially when it's really hard, somebody's really sick. I have friends who are going through like really gnarly divorces right now. My capacity to stay present to what is, even in the face of a friend's hardship, actually helps them to do the same. My level of presence helps them to say, okay, I have to collect all this information. I have to put it into a Google Doc for the judge. You know, like the facts remain the facts and they don't become these giant blown out emotional occurrences because one person in the room is being able to stay present to what is and it doesn't feel comfortable, but the presence is the practice. And I thought I would inquire with you as to has there been anything in this sort of recent or during the writing of this book, aside from the death of your father when you were such a young girl, that compels this understanding and drives this beautifully wrought paragraph? My first response is always. I feel that the human experience each and every day requires that understanding, that fierce compassion is a needed ally throughout our entire human journey. And there are so many examples I could use. And I also want to just underline passionately, as you were talking about presence being contagious and that presence is a transmission, that just one of us uh, being willing to ground in presence uh, offers an invitation into shared presence from any one around us. I had the opportunity to spend last month, the month of January, as resident teacher in Big Sur at a place called the Esalen Institute. And we experienced the major California storms. And it was intense and dramatic. And also the magnitude of witnessing nature's might directly was beautiful. But many, many people went through great difficulty in the storms. The Institute closed and even the experience of being there in that time and noticing that my own willingness to simply rest in stillness, in kindness, in love uh, amidst a great storm touched everyone I interacted with there and invoked their willingness to rest in the storm. And it's that one person's willingness impacting everyone. And I'll also share, you know, in the book, I talk about one particular life experience of getting bit by a tick when I was at the monastery. I think this one's useful because so many people are navigating Lyme or other mysterious illnesses or long COVID or whatever it is. It's an age of mysterious illness. And We need to talk more about the spiritual teachings of mysterious illness and how to find one's uh, fierce compassion through those experiences. And for me, it really was what ended up being about a 10-year period of energy being up and down and what used to be defined as my familiar self or familiar energy or body being truly gone (laughs) and the freedom of that was to get to simply surrender to being with what is as it is, which is meeting life with love in this moment and which is thus receiving the medicine of love in the moment it's needed. As long as we're resisting or pushing away or pitting this moment through our imagination against another uh, better destination, we're not able to directly access the love that actually infuses our being (laughs) all the time. We're turning away from it. We're not receiving the medicine of it. We need that medicine desperately now. So I teach people to really find the balance between both the gentle compassion, sometimes the metaphor of the soft, open hand of receptivity, of listening, and on the other side, 
Manjushri sword, which cuts through yes. illusion. It's yes. powerful um, ally. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is even coming home from uh, leading retreats and assisting family through a really tender, raw time recently, coming back to the East Coast and grounding the past few days here, I've been aware of so many raw, stirred feelings within myself just from coming back into witnessing what's not working in our world uh, directly witnessing the pain of my family right now through difficult challenges they're going through, witnessing so many who I mentor and are in hard times. The beauty is, and the peace is, that fierce compassion is a field that we can experience as holding us all the time and calling us forth all the time. And so the difference between going through this human experience with or without that. It's yes. uh, tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you say on page 60, to sort of to this point, endarkenment invites us to open our hearts to the Dharma gate that exists just behind inconvenience and comfort. Every invitation we're given to take responsibility for ourselves, others, the planet is a Dharma gate. And for if, you, if you're listening or and you don't know the meaning of dharma. It's really just your sort of, what are you here to do is kind of the loosest translation. What is your service? What is your mission? Every invitation we're given to take responsibility is one of those gates. We have known, you say, since the 70s, for instance, that climate change needed to be addressed, yet we did not do so. We have known for decades that our cities were in need of redesign and new infrastructure in the face of our expanding population and changing climate, yet we avoided that task. Here in the United States, we've allowed 400 years of systemic racism to continue to inform our policies and our entire way of life. But fierce compassion is the real opportunity. This sort of perceiving of everything as belonging, meeting everything with love, as hard as it sometimes is, really turns nothing and no one away. And that's what the darkness does. Yes. And that's what's available to us when we drop our false dualistic interpretations of light versus dark. They are both our great teachers. So for instance, let's just bring in for a moment the Tibetan Vajrayana teaching that obstacles do not block our path. They do not impede the path. Obstacles are the path. And this way that you're talking about a collective tendency to want to stay comfortable and perceive discomfort as a problem or something to turn away from, difficult emotions as something to turn away from, and inconvenience as something to uh, turn away from. When this reframe, what it offers is a recognition that turning towards discomfort both allows us to uncover and let be revealed our discomfort resiliency, a much deeper resiliency than we knew we had, and invites us to let ourselves meet with love, with medicine, that which is needing this medicine, turning towards difficult emotions. If we continue to turn away, we miss the experience to heal intergenerational, ancestral karma <laughs> that has been knocking at the door for how long, creating symptoms in our body, creating dysfunction in our society and in our relationships. So the whole notion of learning to turn towards rather than away, uh, this is one of the fundamental teachings, not being afraid of what we label dark, but to consider the degree to which humans have historically use the label darkness to justify kind of putting everything uncomfortable and sticky and unwanted and difficult into some closet or some place we think we can lock it away where it truly just festers. And this is really about healing and being willing to 
be full participants. And as you said, take responsibility, same thing. Responsibility has historically often had a negative connotation. Oh, that wave's heavy. And in practice, it's just the opposite. It's passionate responsibility. It's joyful responsibility because we're relying on a different fuel, not the fuel of fear and judgment, but the fuel of love. Yeah. Yeah. In, uh, Further to that point, Dogen's Song of the Jewel Mirror Samadhi, complications are auspicious. Do not resist them. You've got it. Ugh, makes me so happy to hear that. I've jumped over to page 74.5 when you began practicing Zen and you sort of experienced your first Zen immersion at Green Gulch Farm of all places. I'm so jealous. Um, <laughs> you... Learn to cultivate a soft gaze. And our listener right now is likely somebody who is either meditating or really longing to have a practice where they can just connect to themselves in the quiet, in the dark, and not go crazy and not have this mind that's racing. And you talk about a soft gaze. At first, I was like, why is this here? And now I understand through learning to cultivate a soft gaze, you say, page 75. Whether I was in sitting meditation or practicing informally throughout my day, I was surprised to realize the degree to which attention follows the gaze of the eyes. If you're listening to us right now, go ahead and just soften your eyes a little bit if you can, not if you're driving. You go on. Growing up in Los Angeles, a city dominated by artificial light, Cell phones, colorful billboards, shiny marketing ads, and a culture of wealth overlapping deep poverty. There was a constant onslaught of activity demanding my visual attention. I was more easily distracted by the external world and visual perception than I had admitted to myself. My attention was very often pulled upward and outward into the realm of external distraction. I'm sure our listener can relate. In other words, I was often not settled or anchored within my body but caught up in the stories of my mind. I had received praise for my intellect and good judgment, but nowhere in my schooling, this is so important, had I been taught to be fully present in my body where I could access a deeper and wiser source of intelligence. You go on to say, finally, the soft gaze invited me into a refuge of stillness that existed beyond judgment and labels. In the twilight temple of meditation, there was permission to set aside the assumptions of my inner narrative. There was room to feel the deeper undercurrents of my experience. If that's not a sales pitch for meditation, I don't know what is. (laughs) It's so beautifully wrought, and there isn't really a way out of the artificial, distracting presences until we can just soften where we are inside of ourselves. And that gaze has everything to do with it, I think. Yes. And it is foundational to having a meditation practice. And I think of this as living life as our meditation. Uh, Sitting is just the formal aspect of practice. It's foundational to have that uh, agency, that spiritual sovereignty, of knowing how to turn our attention within, to center, to allow our integrated body-mind to be our center of gravity instead of, again, the left brain or conditioned mind. And for anyone listening who's new to developing a practice, really let this be one of your first intentions, (laughs) just to find your own center. And so as I had that revelation on my first long retreat, of how much my active use of the eyes was connected to kind of an addiction to the mind of judgment, discrimination, uh, comparison, always looking out at the external world instead of learning how to see through, um, well, what we might speak of as inner vision or seeing more clearly from the heart. Yeah? I feel that very, very fully in my body right now. Mm -hmm. Like there's no block to receiving and feeling that. You know, I might invite a pause because this would be a really um, right time to share this poem by Rilke that I offer in the book called The Night. It so points to what we're looking at right now. 
Please. And Rilke says, You darkness of whom I am born, I love you more than the flame that limits the world to the circle it illuminates and excludes all the rest. But the dark embraces everything, shapes and shadows, creatures and me, people, nations, just as they are. It lets me imagine a great presence stirring beside me. I believe in the night. And so just pointing to that capacity to see from wholeness and interconnection rather than the habit of fragmenting life and uh, seeing through the lens of separation. This is so important now (laughs) because there's such a tear in the fabric of human relationship and our relationship with the natural world and, and with ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And to that point, you have a whole chapter on relational intelligence. I'm skipping out to page 168 for our listener. Collective conditioning has taught us, listen carefully, that if the force carrying you forward into the known is not based upon supreme competence, you ought not to move. And darkenment offers a different perspective We all fall sometimes. We all fail at meeting often artificial or unrealistic standards. We all disappoint at times, both ourselves and others. Genuine leadership has nothing to do with supreme confidence or perfection. It has to do with presence, courage, fierce compassion, and vulnerability. This keeps being true. I was interviewing a guy by the name of Mikkel Clark yesterday, a really gifted teacher, speaker, writer, who's really become who he is in the world as respected as he is due to his vulnerability and his willingness to put himself out there and lead from failure, lead from a place of having no clue what's next. And you go on to say, page 169, which I've underlined and starred and highlighted, Leading in the dark is a path of freedom from small self. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, I believe this is one of the most important revolutions happening in our time. And it has to do with the letting go of the old paradigm of power over And power is something that we see as given by externals, by titles, by false strength, by false confidence, to power with or shared power. And that only exists in our vulnerability, in our willingness to let our whole selves be seen, to embrace our whole selves, to embrace the whole whole spectrum. In my uh, personal path, it was a unexpected gift that it was in the period of time when I was navigating Lyme that I was being asked to step forward more and more and more in leadership and teach all kinds of audiences and uh, deepen my work as mentor and guide. And those two things hand in hand were perfect because at first I got to see my conditioning that said, oh no, Uh, but my conditioned ideas of leader or teacher are that I should be appearing strong and I should be having a lot of energy or all the things a leader should be perfect. (laughs) And instead to feel exactly the opposite and yet know deep within my heart that all of the other stuff, the conditioned standards, the made up list was BS and all that mattered was the soft and fierce love in my heart to show up and simply, as I was, sometimes meeting an audience saying, I'm grateful to be here with you this evening, and I'm in an incredibly fragile body. And to start from the place of naming (laughs) weakness um, just invites everyone into, can we drop all of those made-up standards and just rest in shared presence and being human together and then experience Mm. directly the true power of that. That's Mm. where our power is. Right. Mm. And I'll just name, this is fun because this is actually the topic of the next book, which began to give birth to itself, uh, my retreat this past month. So, yeah. Congratulations. (laughs) It's always such a treat. Uh, 
page 170, you talk about liberation from the idea of success as binary. There is both success and failure. And for anyone committed to growth, they sometimes overlap or exist at the same time. I've had that experience. There's no question that's true. Like, enough already. What does success mean, actually? And you also say liberation from the idea of success as a byproduct of our efforts. Like, let's get free of that whole thing because we enter instead, as you say, into the emergent, joyful, encircling, life-affirming experience of the process itself as success. Thank you. And this points to a fixation in the dominant paradigm on product over process. So we're going to justify causing harm to life, overworking ourselves, justify as an example or metaphor, damaging the soil to grow the most, the fastest, the cheapest. But when we recognize the lack of wisdom in that and simply come back to process, what if our job is to show up committed to serving life moment by moment, to meeting life internally, externally, through a compassionate process. That's all. That's all that's required of us. And then we get to reclaim emergence, the palpable, incredible experience of living in emergence where it's not even I'm creating whatever it is. I'm writing a book. I'm co-creating this with life because I'm resting in emergence and I'm not being weighed on by that binary of success failure because I am so committed to and experiencing the gift of the unfolding process of life. And, and just for any doubtful listeners, you know, if we look, for instance, to organic farming as metaphor, we get to see that, oh, yeah, and the healthiest plants and the healthiest soil comes from dedication to process anyway. <laughs> it's not that we then aren't creating incredible products. You with me? Right. Totally, 100%. I'm a very diligent student of Wendy Johnson and gardening at the Dragon's Gate. So, yeah. I I got to learn from Wendy when I was a farm apprentice at Green Gulch all the uh, way back in the, oh, 80s, 90s. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. And just to note for listeners, uh, there are a couple trainings that I offer six month and year long for leaders and facilitators and community activists and Just to note, we're all called to be leaders in this time. It doesn't necessarily point to professional role of leadership when I say that word. But there are two incredible trainings that are about really dismantling our notions of what leadership is and success is and confidence is from this binary place and dropping into a much deeper, more authentic understanding of power and shared power. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I was just going to say, well, two things that you managed to touch on the the last two sort of questions that I have. First, I wanted to tell our listener, you have in this book, a multitude of inquiries and experiential practices. So this book is not just a book to read. It's actually a really rich dialogue with yourself and really great if you teach uh, groups any sort of movement, this is a really great book full of possible curriculum. So that's one. And the second part is, I would love to hear about what it is that you're offering because I don't know enough about it. And I want to also direct our listener to where they can go to find you. Sure. So people can find me at my website, deborahedentoll.com. And there's also information on the nonprofit, Mindful Living Revolution there. And right now, I would say my um, garden of offerings is a very polycultural garden. So a number of different plantings that all support one another and uh, grow well together. And so I offer both silent retreats and retreats in the work that reconnects and eco-dharma, where we're really emphasizing a reconnection with our earth bodies and the body of the earth that needs to happen. 
for our collective healing in this very anthropocentric world that we're living in. And I offer a weekly meditation called Remembering the Already Awakened State. My sangha is, no surprise, called the Fierce Compassion Sangha, and it's a phenomenal global community of people practicing uh, all over the world. And because my second book was about relational mindfulness, I would say that one of my gifts and something I emphasize in many of my offerings are these practices that allow us to remember our already existing intimacy, allow us to connect in Kalyanamita or spiritual friendship in a really profound way, even when we meet on Zoom. And this is important medicine in our world. I have all kinds of retreats on topics ranging from the deep feminine to spiritual activism to luminous darkness. <laughs> and there is one coming up in March through Spirit Rock Online and a longer series coming up through the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. And might also, because there's so many different offerings on my website, just mention that my longer trainings are called The Heart of Listening and Seeing with the Heart. And lastly, next year, I will be launching a spiritual activist training with Kyra Duolingo and Conda Mason through the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. So people who are interested, that will be a four-month program, and you can keep an eye out for that. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, question for you. When our listener refers to you or when I refer to you in the podcast notes, would you rather be referred to as Deborah Eden Tull or just Eden Tull? Thank you. You know, I think it's helpful to use my first name uh, at the beginning so people right. know where to find me and how to find my website. Of but course. everyone just tends to call me Eden. You could even just call me that afterwards. Cool. Great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eden, it shall be. I want to thank you so much for the thorough education that you have offered myself and our listener today. I don't really have the words to say how much it means to me to have all of these different ideas be somehow put together in one piece of writing and then sent to my doorstep to consider for the podcast only to realize that this is like the answer to several million questions that I've had for the last three <laughs> years about Buddhist practice. I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful to the folks at Shambhala for supporting the work and for sending it to me and uh, grateful to our listener too for sticking with us and committing You've committed to yourself. You've committed to a practice. You've committed to the heart of listening, as Eden just said. And that's something. It's not a small thing. So thank you for that. Thank you, Elena, and everyone listening. And just want to name, you referred to the book as something inviting a dialogue with readers. And so I appreciate you for this dialogue and this dialogue with listeners. And we need to be in really deep, embodied dialogue. <laughs>